Okay, so round four, Hareth, we are very late on this video. Um, I mean, we're almost in the mine already. Apologies, have been unwell this past week. Severe bout of the old man flu, it'll get you. So we are just getting to this now. I've had to re-watch all the races. <laughs> Forgot a lot of what happened. Um, so I've done that, ready to record the video here. And this was a chaotic weekend in every sense. Uh, so let's go over it, shall we? And thank you for the messages. I mean, I put a little post out saying that the video was going to be late because I wasn't well. Thanks to the people who sent me a message. I didn't reply to any of them. Sorry about that. A bit rude of me, but thank you very much. Now, as always, everything we're going to talk about will be time-coded, chaptered down below. But jump ahead if you want to, because we're going to start with Moto3 and then Moto2 this week. But we are going to cover everything. Obviously, the advantage of a late video is that all the new announcements on the new regulations and stuff have come before we've recorded for once, rather than waiting till we're done. So we're going to talk about that later too. Jump ahead if you want to hear, if that's all you want to hear about. And if, if someone, just one person out there could do me a favor, because at time of recording, we're stranded on 599 subscribers. We just need one person to click subscribe down the bottom and we're going to tick over to 600. It wasn't long ago we hit 500. We're going at a certain pace now. So let's keep that going. Just one person hit subscribe so that we can tick that over to 600 for now. That'd be good. Now Moto3, Colin Vire, story of the day, wrote an absolutely brilliant race. This was like not a typical Moto3 race that we're used to. We used to just be in all action all the time. Convoy just controlled this one. And it started with a bit of championship drama with David Alonso crashing out. Was it the first lap? Possibly the second. It was the last corner um, of either the first or second lap. And that really shook it up a bit because David Munoz was at the front. He's an aggressive rider, we know that. And then when Colin Vaya came to the front, he wanted to control the race. It seemed like we we're maybe going to get a bit of an all-action one. But David Munoz showed a bit of maturity, just sort of sat there. He thought, well, you know, let's just get this lead group away from everyone. Colin Vaya was setting a good pace, so he obviously was happy with that. That was a lead group of about six that got away. Eventually, they dropped the Joels, Kelso and Esteban. And then eventually, right at the end, we dropped Yamanaka and then... And then Right in the very business end of the race, I think it was Ivan Altola was in third. He just didn't have enough to stay within striking distance of the front two. But I tell you what, I got nervous in that last lap, knowing the reputation of David Munoz and, and really hoping, I mean, whoever wins, wins. I'm not like hoping that one wins over the other, but I do like Colin Vaya and I would, did like seeing him win this race. And I was really worried that there was going to be some sort of David Mignoth dive bomb or something really aggressive. And I thought both of them were probably going to end up in the gravel at one point there. But the two boys held their nerve. We got to the end. In fact, Mignoth had a really good run to the line, almost pipped via, but really well ridden by Colin Vaya. And again, not the typical Moto3 race you expect. But big championship implications in this one because David Alonso, the four-man all weekend, was really in his hands to do the business. And with Olgado struggling on Sunday, only finishing maybe like seventh, it was a big opportunity for David Alonso to do something big in the championship standings here. And you'd think he maybe, what's he on now? He's six points behind. He would have been in the lead of the championship had he sort of even just podium there, I think. A really big missed opportunity for David Alonso. And in the same sense, it's a missed opportunity for Olgado not to do more, but He'll take that. He got away with one this weekend where he didn't have a good race and Alonso thrown it up the road, unfortunately, for him. But yeah, it sort of brings Colin Vai into the championship talk a little bit. 28 points behind Olgado now. If he can get his form right here and start to build something, he'll have a say late in the in the year, but we'll see how that goes. But yeah, David Alonso could have been three wins from four Grand Prix here. It could have been real dominant stuff from him, but, you know, he's not going to win them all. Moto2 was pretty straightforward. Just control from Aldegar. They didn't really get near him. He just sort of held the pace at the front. But once again, we're seeing impressive from Joe Roberts, who goes into the lead of the World Championship now. Five points over Sergio Garcia. Fermin Aldegar looking ominous, just 15 points back from that. Uh, if he starts stringing race wins together like we know he can do, he, when he gets one, he gets three or four, you know, so this could be coming. But we'll see. Because I really like what... I I mean, mainly Sergio Garcia and Joe Roberts are doing here. They're very consistent. Joe probably needs to get a couple of wins if you're going to hold off Fermin and Sergio. And Sergio Garcia obviously has the ability to win. I mean, he's dropped off the podium here this weekend. So you'd want his sort of races where he's not winning. You need him to be in around maybe second or third. But look, you can only do what you can do. If you're having a day where you're just not on the pace, picking up fourth place is good enough. You're building a challenge. Yeah, you're just building a challenge. So, I mean, not much to say about Moto2 this week. There's not a lot happened. It was a pretty straightforward race, like I said. I'm trying to look through the results here. Yeah, everyone was about where you'd expect them to be. Maybe you'd expect to see Ayagura maybe a little bit. You know, he's finished sixth. Maybe, I mean, if Gussie is fourth and he's sixth, I mean, it's about right. I will just say, I mean, I, 
other than like the fact that it's got OnlyFans plastered up the side of it, I, I really like the American Racing Team bike. I just think it looks classy other than, you know, like I said, the OnlyFans thing. That shade of blue, Joe Roberts' number is like really like nice design. Like I really love the font and everything. And when you look at Marcus Ramirez's bike in certain light with like the fluoro, and I, I guess is it a bit more green? If it was a bit more yellow, it's got real Kenny Roberts Jr. Suzuki vibes, the Telefonica ones, because the same shade of blue and then you get that hit of that yellow or yellowish green kind of look. And it's proper vibes, I think, anyway, but... Yeah. Anyway, that was Moto2 this week. Not a lot happened, but the big, big entertainment was all in MotoGP. And this is where we do have quite a bit to talk about. Yeah, look, let's start with the sprint. Let's start with the sprint because it was just like, what happened here? Now, the talk of greasy service and all that, we did have Ranger in the weekend. So a lot of guys hitting this like phantom wet patches that we were getting, which on the Friday, I guess, Saturday, I guess you could see some wet patches, but a lot of the time it wasn't even hit. Like there was this chat that like something to do with the surface there. And when it holds moisture, it resurfaces the moisture in some way through the tarmac i didn't really understand it myself but that's what the commentary team was saying on tnt anyway that it was like the, the water was like seeping back up through and it was an issue for moto 2 on sunday but we did see a lot of crash of people just being just offline especially at turn five and then into the final corner we saw it a lot um but it really caught the riders out here uh turn five a particularly bad offender um where we had the near comical crashes from it was bastianini binder and maybe Bezeki all into the same corner. Or was it Marquez? Alex Marquez. Anyway, they all went straight down, same line, same angle, everything into turn five, bang, bang, bang. They all went down one after the other, followed each other in there, sympathy crashing from two of them. You now we had the drama of Peko and Binder incident. I mean, everything happened here to the point where Quattro ended up on a podium. And then I believe it was our first instance of a tire pressure ruling, catching someone out. And Fabio has been docked however many seconds it is uh, so he's ended up being fifth um and has put pedrosa onto the podium pedro costa's inherited a second place there in that one when he wasn't super quick in that race or at all over the weekend to be honest marks crashed and still ended up sixth it just all happened in this one it was just i mean go back and watch it like it only goes for 20 minutes so you may as well but good performances there i mean all you have to do is really stay on and you'll you're just about picking up a point this week because we ended up with we ended up with like augusto fernandez and Jaramir in the points so you know you're just inheriting points in that race i think it was only like 12 riders didn't crash or something so it was like quite ridiculous and i really enjoyed it it was a lot of fun but that set us up for sunday and i remembered saying this after the sprint on saturday peko getting taken out and i just thought to myself i think i said to the missus like a hundred percent he is still my favorite for Sunday because I think had he not been caught up in that incident, I think he looked like he had the most pace to that point. It wasn't long he was in the race, but, and he wasn't sitting there. Obviously he was probably in like sixth or fifth or sixth or something like that. But he just looked like if he just managed to make his way through, I thought he was going all the way to the front. And he really did show it here. Um, this was a great race. So Pecos won it. We've had Marquez on the podium. Um, and I want to talk about Marquez a little bit in just a second. Pecco, I thought, was really impressive because when he did get the challenge from Mark, I mean, let's first of all, the impressive things that Pecco did this in this race, the pass on the first lap where he went around the outside of Tuma, that's my pass of the season so far. Whether it was necessarily that genius or not, I think what it is is everybody's like, you break a bit earlier on the first lap, maybe you're a bit more cautious. They're all trying to cover the inside. And he just braked as if it was like lap 10, you know, on the normal line with no one around him. And because everyone else is covering the inside, maybe breaking a bit early, being a bit cautious, don't want to run into the guy in front of you, don't want to take anyone out, don't take yourself out, don't want to push too hard on the front on the first lap. Because everyone else was doing that. His just normal line and break you just took him past like two or three guys. So it was it was it was brilliant to watch from the the aerial footage. It was great. And then later in the race, gets the challenge from Mark, has to scrap a little bit to the point where it's a little bit dodgy, has to, you know, ride into the side of him to sort of hold him off but does twice let him through and undercut him. And then once he sees off that challenge, just to rip out the lap that he ripped out, that's what won him the, won him the race. It was a really impressive ride, I thought, from Peko. Bez returned to form into third place. Good to see. Hopefully that keeps up. With Mark, it is looking like now he has sort of figured something out. He's looking quite good. Really Leading in the sprint. I didn't mention that before, but he was leading in the sprint, you know, and then crashed to hand the win over to um, to Jorge Martin. And again, we'll talk about Martin in a sec as well. And then here, I mean, from the point that Martin crashed uh, from the lead of this one on Sunday, Mark was straight away was just like, the hunt is on. The hunt is on. 
and he knew he was going to go from 30, he was going to go past Bears, and he was chasing Pecker. It was quite impressive. The only thing I want to mention here is, I mean, I don't have statistics on this or anything. It's just a feeling, and I'm just thinking out loud here. Where does everyone sit on Mark's race craft? Because I know, obviously, for the last 10 years, he's been the quickest guy on two wheels, and he obviously can scrap, and he likes to scrap, and he's really aggressive. But when it comes to, like, thinking out a race, where does everyone think his race craft is at when you compare, you know, the race craft of some of the old champions. I mean, the obvious comparison is always Rossi, where Rossi would almost like you'd see him planning this out and you could almost read what he was you know, going to do, but he couldn't stop him from doing it because he would just play his hand in a perfect way. He'd pick the right corner. He'd sit there for five, six laps behind a guy. He'd pick the corner he wants to do it on. He'd, he'd do it so late that they couldn't get him back. Mark is very much, as soon as he gets the opportunity, as soon as he's within striking distance, he goes for it. Now, certainly that is entertaining, but if you're thinking about it from a, are you going to win the race doing that perspective? And like I said, a race craft perspective. Are you thinking the race out? How are you going to do it? It just feels like it's all just see it, do it, see it, do it, see it, do it. There's no like, well, I've caught him. I'm quicker than him. I need to line up this move into this corner, which is a hard move to put because it was, he was quick through, I think it was seven and eight. So when he was going into, well, when you're going into that stadium section, that's where he made the moves. Is it thinking maybe, could you have just, try to tuck yourself in behind him so tight that then you could make the move into the final corner. Like, I don't know. Can you think it out more? Instead of just as soon as you're within striking distance, within a bike's length, he was just like, I'm firing it up. I'm going up the inside. I'm firing it through the inside. I'm running wide. I don't care. It's like, could you have thought about that a bit more? Maybe sat there for two laps, see where he's strong, see where you're strong. You know, I mean, I kind of guess he probably already knew that, but then it doesn't make sense that he would be so rash to make the move. And the reason I, th I bring it up is, and again, I don't have statistics on this because I don't know what his, his record is in sort of those one-on-one -on -one duels that you end up with towards the end of the race. The most memorable ones for me that have had Mark in him are ones where he's kind of lost. I mean, I don't know how many, I mean, you think of Rins in Silverstone, a very famous one. All the duels he had with um, Dovi, especially at, you know, um, in Austria. I don't remember him coming out on top in many of those. I'd known him about his early career if he was maybe a bit stronger in him, but, you know, I'm talking like 13, 14, 15. Certainly once we got to the point where the main challenger was Dovi to now, I feel like he's not won many of those. There was the one with, I think he's lost one to Pecco before. There was one with maybe, was that the one in Aragon or was that Bastianini? Anyway, there's a few of these where I just remember back and I just remember kind of losing them all. Is the only flaw in Marquez's arsenal, and no one's perfect, everybody had their thing, right? And I guess Rossi's flaw was that he was never just outright as quick as the likes of maybe Mark or or Casey, for example, but he could race craft his way to manufacturing a win, you know, whereas Mark's a bit the opposite. He's got all the pace, but when it, when you do have to think your way through a race to try and get yourself that win, like in this situation, he maybe is a bit rash. And again, I, it happened earlier in the race. Did it happen earlier in the race? Uh, maybe I'm thinking of the sprint where as soon as he, no, there was earlier in the race, I think as soon, there was one where, you know, he just went flying up the inside just straight away and got undercut again, I think it was. God, I only watched it that bloody yesterday. I'm trying to think back. I should have written it down. But there was another one where, like, as soon as he got within striking distance, he just went for it and conceded the position straight away. If he just maybe line that up for another couple of corners, maybe he can make a more solid pass that is more sustainable in the long run. He did end up getting past the guy anyway, but the point is, you're wasting time. Just wanted to think out loud on that one and see what your perspective is. And I mean, again, I don't know if there is a statistic for this. Maybe he does have a positive record in, in duels, but I can seem to remember a lot of the, the ones where he's lost are the most memorable ones. But yeah, let me know what you think about that. Now, let's move on to Martin. And this is where I think this is, look, this one looked harsh, the way he went down. The bike just sort of let go. It was when, Again, I said this last week with Mark's one or the last time, you know, when Mark crashed and, and his went so early, this did the same thing. This just went early. Like there's almost no chance of saving that, fixing it, knowing even what you've done wrong. But again, it is it does talk into that consistency factor with Martin where he has all the speed in the world. I still think Pecco was probably going to be quicker at this one, but imagine this three-way scrap for the lead would have been brilliant. And this is where Bastianini's hanging in there where he just, like, again, he's just picked up a fifth here. Didn't have the pace. It's not the elite pace that you want to see from a guy in the factory team, but you know he will have places where he's just quicker than everyone Bastianini. He has that in him. And then when he's not doing well, he doesn't crash that much. I mean, I might be short-term thinking here. Again, pull me in, lads. But just, he's happy to take these fifths here. He's like, I don't have it today. I'll take my fifth. I'll bank my points. I'll go home. And he's finding himself five points behind Pecco, 22 behind Martin. He's hanging in there. He's just going to hang in there 
pick up his podiums where he can, pick up his wins when he does have the really good days, which, like I said, we know he will have. And then he makes it a really hard decision for Ducati. I know Mark's obviously in the conversation as well, um, but Martin just keeps, every time he looks unbeatable, he just keeps giving bringing, you know, giving people a sniff. And we know Pecco's like that too. So Pecco will drop the bike here and there um, from really good positions and give away really good points. And I think Bastianini probably just knows that is going to happen for them too. Mark's going to do the same. So I don't know. With Martin, it's just it's that inconsistency. You just want to see him just be like, I'm the dominant guy here. I'm going to stay the dominant guy here. Even if he comes third there or fourth, that's 16, 13 points, even better. You make yourself so much harder to beat in the World Championship. Now, Pecco at 17 points behind. I think you probably have him over the long run of the season. Do you have him as favorite there from only 17 points back after four rounds? Probably in a factory factory team. You got to remember that. And then once again, I mean, you're looking at this, and you, just to, to pick out other notables, Vinales ninth. <sighs> no one can make you so convinced that they're an absolute elite title challenger one week, and then have you thinking, why did I waste my time even bothering talking about him the next? Because this is pure. Maverick, pure Maverick. For all money, a title contender for the last two rounds and then comes here to a Spanish Grand Prix as a Spaniard and just pots about in ninth. Come on, come on. And and I'd say it's like, oh, maybe the Aprilia wasn't as good here. Miguel Oliveira's finished eighth. So, and Pedro, I mentioned he came second in the uh, sprint. A rare, just quiet one for him down in 10th. Surprised it took this long to have one of those, but just goes to show the man is human. Here's what we've all come here for, the All Japan Cup. For the first time ever, Fabio has not won the All Japan Cup this week. He struggled a bit. He's come fourth in the All Japan Cup. Our winner this week, 10 points goes to Juan Mir. Rin second, Takanakagami on the podium of the All Japan Cup. Then, like I said, Fabio in fourth. Enter the chat, Stefan Bradl. Two points for him in fifth and Luca Marini. Just the point in sixth. And this is still worrying for Luca. I mean, it gets more worrying every week for Luca because when you think to yourself, look, he is struggling. He's way behind all the other Hondas. He couldn't also be behind Stefan Brattle, could he? Well, yeah, he is. Over full race distance, he's finished two seconds behind Stefan Brattle, who was nine seconds behind Fabio Quattararo further up the road. Is it panic stations yet for Luca? Possibly. This leaves us Fabio on 33 points after his first non-win in the All Japan Cup. Mir goes to 20. Alex Rins on 13, Takanakagami on 9, Luca Marini on 9, Johan Zarco on 8, and Stefan Brattle in 7th on s- 2 points for Stefan Brattle. We've got 7 riders in the All Japan Cup now. And we will have more once Cal Crutchlow enters. And if he can get a point in the All Japan Cup, Cal Crutchlow, you've got to finish the race. We're going to have an 8th person in the All Japan Cup. Just to, one last thing on Hareth itself. I talk about being a chaotic weekend. It was chaotic to the point where we got reported a record attendance for the Grand Prix weekend. A record attendance. I don't know what it was. Can't remember. And then we got that amended to say that it wasn't a record attendance because the attendance had been misreported by 100,000 fans. <laughs> this is the most like Spanish thing I've ever heard of. Oh, you could include the Italians in that, I suppose. I get it maybe missing by 10,000 or a misread of... How have you got that wrong by 100,000 fans? Are you, are you taking the piss? Like you're 100% taking the piss there. Hundred there. Anyway, I just thought that just summed up the weekend as a whole. We're going into the new regulations here. We have had it announced. We're going to 800 cc engines. A change in the bore and all that stuff. Really technical stuff that if you don't understand engines, I have a basic understanding of engines, but it really means very little to me. We're getting a reduction on. I'll put the graphic on the screen. Reduction on tank capacity. Reduction on aero width and how far they can extrude out the front of the bike, I suppose. No mention here, this is one thing I was curious about, is there's no mention of, like, obviously they're like, oh, the wings can only be within this space or within that far forward. But there's a lot of things and bits hanging off the front of the bike there with, like, the um, like on the forks and, and beside the forks and on the little um, front fender and all that kind of stuff all along the bottom of the bike for, like, ground effect and all that. I don't know how this affects any of that. So you could still have fucking wings nanging off all over the place but yeah but your front wing like your f1 style front wing just has to be a bit narrower and shorter so i don't know how it works around all the other bits of wings unless there is stuff written deep into the regulations that we're not seeing on these like just basic graphics they give us right the other thing is whole shot devices are gone thank god for that because if everyone has it then no one has it so you may as well not have it I- i'll refer it to an f1 thing where it's like having drs available in practice and quali- like in qualifying i like, just have it turned off in qualifying because everyone's just hitting the button so everyone's getting the same event, like it does. 
doesn't make any sense. Anyway, and geez, I think I'm about to run out of battery on my camera here. So let's wrap this up quickly. That was everything. Yeah. They, we tested. We tested in Hereth after the race. People tested parts, I guess. The times mean nothing. I don't really look at this stuff. It's just whether they get to the next Grand Prix and they've improved because they put extra parts on it or whatever. I know some notable thing that happened is, you know, Honda and Yamaha tested a lot of different parts and Ralph Fernandez got to test a 24 Aprilia. I don't know if that means he's getting one. Maybe. Okay, we'll know. We'll know when we get to the next round. Next round is Le Mans. The next round, I mean, this video came out late. The next video might be coming out late as well because I'm going to be at Le Mans. I'm not back till Wednesday, which means I'm not recording it until at least Thursday, maybe Friday. I don't know. When's the race after that? Let's have a look at the calendar. Will I get it out before the next race? There is a week in between, so we will get a video out. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you on the next one. Cheers.